The title of our sermon is Believe to the Glory of God. Believe to the Glory of God. John's intention in writing the Gospel of John is to reveal to us Jesus as the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Son of God, God the Son, who has come to save his people from their sins. And he is intending to reveal him as the Christ so that you and I would believe in him and have eternal life. And we've seen as we work through the Gospel of John so far, we've seen the Lord's power revealed. We've seen the Lord's wisdom revealed, his compassion his grace, his mercy. We've seen his oneness with the Father. We've seen his redemptive purpose. We've seen his righteous indignation as he cleared out the temple. We've learned so much about the Lord, and that's John's intention. John wants to reveal to us Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, that believing in him, putting our faith and trust in him, we would have life eternal. Now, we've seen throughout the gospel account how Jesus testifies with his words and then he affirms with his works that he is the Christ. Now, the works during his earthly ministry, ministry were numerous and his works are glorious. Now, they are inarguable proof of his messianic credentials. John would later say that there are so many things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Now, of those many works, many works, innumerable works, of those many signs that he did, the Holy Spirit in the Gospel of John specifically chooses signs or works to include here various miracles to record. And the bulk of those miracles are recorded here in John chapters 2 through John chapter 12 in a section that many have called the book of signs. It's called the book of signs because these signs, these works or miracles all point to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now in building to a glorious climax, these miracles or signs of his earthly ministry culminate here with the Lord Jesus Christ raising a man named Lazarus from the dead. And this even a foreshadowing of the ultimate miracle, which is Jesus Christ himself being raised from the dead. And the viewpoints concerning Jesus are becoming more and more polarized as he continues to preach and perform miracles. Many in Jerusalem at this time are hard-hearted. They are steeled in unbelief. While many, as we saw last week, beyond the Jordan, believe in him. The stark contrast, this stark contrast is the setting in which Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead. Believers are going to be added as the Lord performs this miracle, and yet there are going to be others who become more and more hostile. And as we'll see as we work through this text, this text will eventually become, or this event, this miracle will eventually become the impetus, if you will, for those in Jerusalem who oppose him to put him to death. The raising of Lazarus indisputably points to Jesus Christ as the Son of God. However, raising of Lazarus also further, further infuriates the opposition. You think about it, it's just like Pharaoh, right? Just like Pharaoh before the devastating judgment miracles of God in Egypt. Just like Pharaoh, the Jews are going to harden their hearts in unbelief. And in verse 47, they'll even call a council to decree his death and they will eventually murder their Messiah. It's a great difference, isn't it? A great contrast. The question becomes, where are you on either side of that great chasm? What side are you on this morning? There's no middle ground. This is black or white. There's no middle ground. You're either for him or against him, right? You're either for him or you scatter abroad. There is no middle ground. Are you with the hard-hearted Jews in Jerusalem against him in your unbelief, in your apathy, in your indifference? Are you on that side of the chasm? Remember, the Jews in Jerusalem, those that oppose him, are obsessively religious. Are you just playing religion this morning? Or are you following fervently the Lord Jesus Christ in faith? Those in Jerusalem are religious hypocrites, are you one of those, or are you one who follows Christ, 
who lives for Christ by faith in him. If Jesus Christ has the power and the authority to raise Lazarus from the dead, then the Lord Jesus Christ has the power and has the authority to grant eternal and everlasting life to those who will turn from their sin and put their faith in him. You are going to die. But listen, Jesus Christ has conquered death. He is the resurrection and the life. And the Lord Jesus Christ has the power and has the authority to raise Lazarus from the dead. And if he has the power and the authority to raise Lazarus from the dead, then he has the power and the authority to grant you eternal life. Put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Glorify God and believe in him. John's account of these events begin in chapter 11, verse 1, where the Bible reads, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary, and her sister Martha. And it was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now verse 1 begins with a certain man was sick. It sounds a little impersonal, but Jesus... Lazarus, Mary, and Martha all knew each other very well. If you remember, turn with me to Luke chapter 10. If you remember Luke chapter 10, the Lord was making his way through Judea when he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In Luke chapter 10, he sends out the 70 disciples two by two into the cities ahead of him, and they come back having served the Lord, and they come back rejoicing, right? And he meets a certain lawyer in Luke chapter 10, teaches them the parable of the Good Samaritan, and then he spent some time in a certain village with a certain woman and her sister. Look at Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 38. Now it happened as they went, that he entered a certain village and a certain woman. Notice the similarity of language there, don't you? A certain village and a certain woman named Martha welcomed him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part which will not be taken away from her. The relationship begins here in Luke chapter 10. And so Jesus and Martha and Mary and Lazarus all knew each other well. So back in John chapter 11, verse 1, we learn that Lazarus now, the brother of Martha and Mary, is sick. Lazarus is an abbreviated form of the name Eleazar, which means God helps. God's going to help Lazarus here in this section of Scripture. But Lazarus, Mary, and Martha all live in Bethany. It's one of a couple of Judean cities with the same name. And this one just a short distance from Jerusalem. It's about two miles along the road to Jericho. If you went... East from Jerusalem, across the brook Kidron, around the Mount of Olives, you'll hit the town of Bethany, the little village of Bethany. And that's where Mary and Martha and Lazarus live. But then John offers an explanation of who Mary is in verse 2. Look at verse 2 with me. Now, Mary was a very common name, but this particular Mary and her particular story would have been obviously and commonly known to the people. John and others were telling her story. And so John uses her story. We're going to get to that story in the next chapter. But John uses her story as a way of identifying her here. He says in verse 2, It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Look at John chapter 12 and look at verse 1. Here John writes, then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus, who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was, was one of those who sat at the table with him. Then Mary took a pound of very costly oil of spark, spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. So in John chapter 11, verse 2, the Lord identifies Mary by that act that we'll get to. It's a beautiful story. We're going to see that as we work verse by verse through the Gospel of John. So in this now, between Luke, here in John, and the account with Mary, we see how interconnected Jesus was with these people, 
with Mary and Martha and Lazarus. So much so that the sisters reach out and contact the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 3 with serious news about Lazarus. And in their statement to him, you get a sense of the relationships that they had, how close they were with one another. It's also clear from the statement that they felt loved by the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 3. Therefore the sisters sent to him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now the word Lord there, not quite yet used the way that we would use that term of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, having the blessing of progressive revelation, we know that the Lord here is the Lord of glory, right? The Lord of lords, the King of kings, worthy of glory, honor, and power. But Mary and Martha would come to clearly understand what this title means. However, in verse 3, they use it more like a title of respect. He's their master, and they are his disciples. They might have used the term rabbi or the term teacher as well. As we come to verse 4, we see the Lord's intention behind the miracle that encompasses chapter 11. We see the point, then, of our entire text. In verse 4, when Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now, because of his sickness, Lazarus is going to physically die. But his sickness isn't unto death in any ultimate sense, because his sickness is ultimately unto resurrection and life. Jesus Christ is going to raise Lazarus from the dead. This is a glorious miracle. Now, in verse 4, as we prepare for the Lord Jesus Christ to perform this miracle and raise Lazarus from the dead... That resurrection in life has a three-part purpose. It has a three-part purpose that we begin to see in verse 4. The first part of that purpose in verse 4, it's for the glory of God. Now let's think about that for a moment. Not primarily that God would be praised for the miracle. That's certainly going to take place, but that's not the primary meaning here. It's not primarily that God would be worshipped for the miracle. He certainly will be. But that's not primarily what's being spoken of here in verse 4. It's primarily for the purpose that God's glory would be revealed through the miracle. Do you see the difference? Now, it demonstrates or displays his power. It demonstrates or displays God's sovereignty over life and death. The purpose for which Jesus will raise Lazarus from the dead is to reveal, to display for us the glory of God. The second, God's glory is nowhere more preeminently revealed than in his own son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's glory is most splendidly, wondrously displayed in his own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because God the Father seeks to glorify God the Son, the second purpose for raising Lazarus from the dead in verse 4 is so that the Son of God may be glorified through it. So God the Father now, in revealing his own glory, glorifies God the Son. God the Son, in doing the work that the Father has given him to do in raising Lazarus from the dead, glorifies God the Father. Jesus said in John chapter 5, verse 23, that the Father's intention for the miracle there and all of his miracles is so that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. So the purpose for which Jesus Christ will raise Lazarus from the dead is so that the Father may glorify the Son in revealing him as the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Son of God. Incidentally, we can take from verse 4 that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are glorified when they are revealed for who they are. They're revealed in their glory. So, now think about it. If the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed in his work to raise Lazarus from the dead, then how much more is his glory revealed in his work at the cross in dying for sinners? That's why the, the cross 
we think of as where God the Father glorifies God the Son. At the cross, he is revealed as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, right? He's revealed as the sacrifice for sinners. And at the cross, he is most glorified. The cross is the supreme display of the glory of the Son of God, and he is glorious in our sight, amen? Now one, in raising Lazarus from the dead, God reveals his own glory. Two, in raising Lazarus from the dead, God glorifies Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God. And the third purpose for this miracle is so that, as the Lord says down in verse 15, so that you may believe, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. God doesn't have to reveal his glory to us, does he? But he chooses to. Paul says he's not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. God didn't have to send Jesus Christ into the world to die, but he did. And he did so that you and I would believe in him and have eternal life in his name. The third purpose for which Jesus will raise Lazarus from the dead is revealed in verse 15, where Jesus says, I am glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. He's speaking there to his disciples. We know that the faith of his disciples was strengthened in witnessing this miracle. We know that the faith of Mary and Martha and Lazarus was grounded and rooted and established and strengthened by this miracle. And we know from our text that many will come to believe in him as a result of the miracle. I'm glad for your sakes, Jesus says, that I was not there that you may believe. So Mary, Martha, and Lazarus are in Bethany. Think about their circumstances for a moment. The sisters are desperate, right? They love their brother Lazarus. Lazarus is terribly sick, terribly sick. He's sick to the point of death. Those are his circumstances. That's where they're at. The purpose that governs these circumstances is the revelation of the glory of God. I want you to, I want you to let this sink in as we talk through this. The purpose of this trial that Lazarus and his sisters are enduring is so that the Son of God would be glorified in it. The purpose is further expanded in the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, in revealing his glory as the Son of God, intends to strengthen their faith and to save others. Verse 45, Then many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did, believed in him. What can we take from this? Horrendous circumstances, desperate circumstances. God's purpose governing these circumstances. Listen, God intends to use your circumstances in the same way and for the same purpose. God intends to use your circumstances. It may be to strengthen some. It may be to save others. It's certainly going to be to grow and to mature you. If you're in Christ, it is certainly to conform you into the image of his son who was made himself perfect through suffering. God intends to use your circumstances. In verse 4, the sickness is not unto death. The sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. The trial is not unto despair but for the glory of God. The adversity is not unto discouragement, but that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Do you see? The hardship is not unto faithlessness. The busy schedule is not unto disobedience. The marriage is not unto strife or contention or divorce. The relationship is not unto suspicion or bitterness. The singleness is not unto loneliness. The job is not unto complaining. The difficulties you face in the church are not unto fleeing. The liberty is not unto licentiousness. The desires are not 
unto worldliness. The life lived is not unto self. The circumstances you face are certainly not and ultimately not unto you, but for the glory of God that the Son of God may be glorified through them. Do you see? And so that some of you may be strengthened and so that others of you may be saved. So that you may believe so that you may believe that God is sovereign over your sickness. So that you may believe that God builds faith through the trial. So that you may believe that God is your comfort in adversity. That God is your provision in hardship. That God is to rule and reign over your schedule. That God builds character through perseverance. That God gives peace when you love one another. That God gives joy when you find your sufficiency in Him. That God gives contentment when you are grateful. That God esteems holiness in His people. That God is our portion. That God is our hope. That God is the very breath of our lives and the very purpose of our being. That God alone is worthy of all praise, honor, and worship, and glory. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Here's how you apply that truth. I want you to consider for a moment how you handle difficulty. How you handle trial. What are you going through right now? What are you dealing with? How are you handling difficulty? Here's how you apply that truth. You stop grumbling and complaining. You stop grumbling and complaining. You work out your salvation in that circumstance, whatever it is. Because it is God who is at work in you and he has ordained it. In fear and trembling, you see to it that you glorify God in that circumstance rather than attempting to glorify yourself by complaining and grumbling. Do you see? Stop playing the victim to a busy schedule. Stop being disobedient or unfaithful and using your big, busy schedule or anything else for that matter as an excuse. Work out your salvation among the many demands of this life because it is God who is at work in you and he must be preeminent in fear and in trembling. See to it that you glorify God by seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness rather than attempting to glorify yourself and acting like you know best how to manage your own life. Have you ever thought that the purpose of a busy schedule might be so that you will learn to glorify God by getting your priorities straight. Stop being bitter toward your husband, toward your wife, your boss, or your brother. Work out your salvation in those relationships. It is God who is at work in you, and he intends for you to love one another. In fear and trembling, see to it that you glorify God in that relationship by forgiving as you have been forgiven, by loving as you have been loved. We could go on for days making applications of this, right? I want you to do that, do that for yourself right now. What circumstance are you facing? Where are you at? Do that for yourself right now. Make application. You have several circumstances right now, truth be known, in your life that are blessed opportunities from the Lord whereby you may mortify your flesh and glorify Him. Amen? Think about what those are. Don't neglect God in your circumstances. He is sovereign over your circumstances. Work it out right now in fear and trembling because it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. If we think about our lives that way, and that, that's the way the Bible teaches that we should think about our lives and our relationship to him. We live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for us. We live 
by faith. In him we live and we move and we have our being. So to simply say, right, to simply say, I glorify you, God, is utterly meaningless, right? Unless you're actually glorifying him. To actually glorify God, you would seek to know him as he has revealed himself in, in his word. So that, in accord with that truth that you find in his word about God, you can worship him from the heart. When you worship him from the heart, in spirit and in truth, that is glorifying God. Do you see? To glorify God, you would seek to conform yourself to his holy character. As he has revealed himself in his word. He said, be holy, for I am holy. So, to glorify God, you would obey his commandments. You love as he loves, you forgive as he forgives. You were created in Christ Jesus for good works, and so you will live to serve him with good works. You would seek to conform yourself to his holy character. To glorify God, you would proclaim him as he has revealed himself in his word. You would preach Christ and his glory to lost sinners. You would speak of him to your children as you lie down, as you rise up, and as you walk along the way. So how do you display the glory of God in your circumstances? You display the glory of God through words, through works, and through worship. Now think about that. Through your words, through your works, and through your worship. You glorify God through praise, proclamation, and your pattern, your pattern of living. You do that, and God will be glorified. God will be revealed in all splendor in your own life, God is revealed. The Son of God glorified through it. You will be sanctified and sinners will be saved. That's what we see here happening in John chapter 11. The purpose for which Jesus Christ raises Lazarus from the dead is so that God's glory would be revealed, the Son of God would be glorified through it, and so that you may believe. <laughs> your faith will be strengthened and matured and grown. Others will come to salvation. Uh, take all of that into consideration. Take all of that into consideration. The glory of God. The glory of the Son of God. The strengthened and matured faith of his disciples. The sanctification of his saints. The ultimate glorification of his saints. Their conformity to their Lord. The resulting, as a result of the trials and the difficulty and the diversity that the Lord ordains, the resulting perseverance the resulting character, right? The resulting hope. The salvation of sinners. Think of all that the Lord accomplishes in his omnipotence and in his omniscience. Taking all of that into consideration, do you think that God is mean by putting you through a tough time? <laughs> right? You put it in that light, it's comical. We can chuckle about that. It's, it's foolish to think that, right? But do we sometimes think that? <laughs> No, God is not mean by putting you through a tough time. God is not heartless or callous or cold-hearted toward you in your trial. God is not, not uncaring toward you and what you're going through. No, God is intimately involved in everything that you're going through. John doesn't want you to think that either. He makes a point of saying in chapter 11, verse 5, listen to this. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Lazarus. The sickness and death and resurrection of Lazarus are certainly for the glory of God, but it's also for the ultimate good of Martha and Mary and Lazarus and the disciples and you and I. It's ultimately for good. There are many who think that in the pages of John chapter 11 here, that they find that God is callous and heartless and mean. Believing that God is good, believing that he's merciful and gracious, and then trusting him alone for salvation. Now think about this. Believing that God is good and gracious and merciful, right? And then trusting God alone for salvation while entrusting yourself to him in all the circumstances of your life is the very fabric of genuine saving faith. Many simply won't do that. They say they trust him. 
Oh, I trust Christ. I believe in him. I'm saved. But they're not exercising that day-by-day day faith, that minute, sometimes second-by-second second faith in Christ, in their lives, to obey him and to live for him in their circumstances. They'd rather believe that God is mean. Maybe they believe that God intends to do them harm or he intends to make them miserable in a sinful marriage. Maybe he intends to oppress them with a hated job or torment them with bad health or God is going to prop them up on a fence post like Pharaoh and shoot them down for his own glory and rejoice while they burn in hell. It's not what the Bible teaches. That's not the God of the Bible. Romans 8, verse 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. Well, someone may retort, well, how do I know I'm one of the called? Turn from your sin, trust Christ, and you are. Some people actually look at verse 6 as proof that Christ is mean. Some people actually look at verse 6 as evidence that Jesus Christ is cold-hearted, that he's callous towards some people, or that he's callous or uncaring in our need. Look at verse 6. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed two more days in the place where he was. And then they add Eeyore in verse 16. He's going to die. We might as well die with him. All right? And then they add Martha in verse 21. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Or they add Mary in verse 32. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Or they add some from the crowd in verse 37. Couldn't he have kept this man from dying? And all of a sudden, you get a bunch of faithless people that somehow believe that Jesus Christ is cold-hearted, uncaring, or even mean in their trial. Some have even implied that it was the Lord's fault that Lazarus died. Think about this now. Your suffering, your difficulty, that trial that you're facing, that hardship, it does not mean that the Lord Jesus Christ is uncaring. It means exactly the opposite. That difficulty, that hardship that you're facing does not mean that Jesus Christ is callous or oppressive or seeking to punish you. It's exactly the opposite. Let me tell you about the truth of verse 6. Look at verse 6. Now it begins, so when he heard. That's the correct translation. Hos un ekusen. So when he heard. That's correct. Verse 5 says, Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, Verse 6, he stayed two more days. Now, does that mean that Jesus thought to himself, right? Lazarus has got the flu, so I'm going to love Lazarus from afar. <laughs> no, that's not, what, that's not what's going on here. He loved them, and so he waited. His love for them was the motivation for why he waited to go. Now, let that sink in for a moment. While you're letting that one marinate, follow me while I give you, explain it another way. In verse 3, Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick. In verse 6, he waits two more days. Right? Then in verse 11, after those two days, he tells them that Lazarus has fallen asleep and it's time to go. Now, falling asleep was a euphemism for the fact that Lazarus has died. All right? Lazarus is now dead. So in verse 17, they finally leave for Bethany. They arrive there, and they find that Lazarus has been dead in the tomb for four days. Now, it was custom 
Jewish custom to bury a body the day that the person died. A burial took place uh, a vast majority of the time on the same day, right? That means if you put the math together, right, and you start looking at this, figuring this out, the Lord Jesus Christ was about four days away. Well, we know from John chapter 10, the end of John chapter 10, that the Lord Jesus Christ had gone back to where John was baptizing. That's Bethany beyond the Jordan, Bethabara, or a, a region known as, as Bethania. Bethania. Bethania was about 100 miles from Jerusalem. About 100 miles from Jerusalem. We know from Jewish records that a man could walk about 25 miles a day. Well, there you have your four days worth of travel time, right? So Lazarus was sick when he got the news in verse 3. The Lord Jesus Christ said that he was sick. The Lord waits two days until in verse 6, he knows that Lazarus has now died. When he knows in his omniscience that Lazarus has died, he tells them it's time to go. They then travel for four days to get to Bethany, which is just two miles to the east of Jerusalem. They got there in verse 17, and Lazarus has now been dead in the tomb for four days. Now think about this for a moment, despite all the accusations against the Lord Jesus Christ here. Even if he had left immediately when he got the news, Lazarus would have still been dead in the tomb for two days, right? He would have still died. So Lazarus didn't die because the Lord drug his feet here, <laughs> The Lord wasn't being exorbitantly callous or neglectful or fearful because of the persecution in Jerusalem. It was none of those things. So what was the purpose of waiting then? Well, verse 5 says he loved them. <laughs> We're going to put this together. Verse 5, he loved them, and so verse 6, he waited. The two-day delay was motivated by his love for them. His love for his disciples, his love for lost people. Now why? Why? Well, according to the Talmud, the Talmud was a collection of rabbinic writings, first century Jews believed that the soul of a deceased person hovers around the body for three days after death. They described the soul as being lost or confused and wanting to re-enter the body. And they believed that in a three for three day period, that people might resuscitate and the soul would re-enter the body, they would come back to life again. After the body begins to decay, they thought around the fourth day, the soul finally departs for good and never returns. We know from Martha in verse 39 that that decay had begun to set in. Martha, the sister of him who was raised from the dead, said to him, Lord, by this time there's a stench, for he has been dead four days. Now put it all together then, okay? Put it all together. A great trial has befallen three people that the Lord loves, that the Lord cares for. The purpose of the trial is so that God's glory would be revealed, so that the Son of God, Christ, Jesus Christ, would be glorified through it, and so that his disciples would grow in their faith and that others would be saved. Now, Jesus loves them. Jesus loves them. So he's not going to let some silly superstition rob them of this tremendous blessing. So he waits long enough to inarguably demonstrate that he is the resurrection and the life. And in the process, he cultivates the faith of his disciples. He firmly grounds and roots and establishes the faith of Lazarus and his sisters. And he grants saving faith to sinners along the way. Right? Praise the Lord. God knows what he's doing. Amen? God knows what he's doing. Listen, because God knows what he's doing, you can trust him in your trial. God knows what he's doing. You can believe him. This is, this is often in our lives, right? We incur the fatherly correction of God. We incur the fatherly discipline, the fatherly chastening of a good, heavenly, perfect father who chastens us as a father chastens his son. We incur fatherly instruction. Oftentimes that comes in the soil of difficulty, in the soil of suffering and trial and adversity. 
But through those circumstances, you can believe Christ to the glory of God. But when you moan and grumble and complain and woe is me, God doesn't care about me. Or worse yet, God is heartless or callous or mean toward me. You're not glorifying God, right? Not glorifying God. When you think about all that good, all that good, all that blessing that comes through difficulty, right? We can say, as the people of God who trust Christ, we can say with James, can't we? Count it joy, brothers. Count it joy. Consider it, right? Reckon it in your mind. Count it. Doesn't mean you necessarily feel joyful in the trial. You are counting it, reckoning it, considering it, all joy to fall into various trials because you know what God is producing in you through those difficulties, through those trials. God knows what he's doing. The circumstances we find in John chapter 11 are circumstances that are going to severely test the Lord's disciples. The Lord's decision to return to Judea soon after having narrowly escaped the opposition in Jerusalem, narrowly escaping death there, it's a fearful and dangerous notion to them. They want to, as far away from Jerusalem, Jerusalem as possible. What are you to do when you face difficult circumstances? When that difficulty is coming, you see it coming, right? It happens in two ways. You may see it coming a mile off, or it may blow up in your face all of a sudden, right? What do you do? How do you respond? How do you react? With the remaining verses of our text here, let me encourage you to believe in Christ, to trust him in your circumstances to the glory of God in four ways. First, you trust and obey. You trust and obey. Secondly, you trust in work. You trust and you keep serving. Just keep swimming, just keep swimming. <laughs> you trust and believe, and then you trust all the way. You trust all the way. First, you trust and obey. Let's look at the example of his disciples. Verse 7. After all this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, <laughs> lately the Jews sought to stone you, and are you going there again? The Lord says, hey guys, let's go to Judea. And it had to be the last thing that they would have considered doing. Have you thought this through, Lord? The Jews just tried to put you to death there. They picked up stones against you. And you want to go there again? They might have thought in their minds, listen, Lord, why don't you heal Lazarus like you healed the nobleman's son? You didn't have to go there. <laughs> let's not go back to Judea. The disciples are fully aware of how dangerous this is. The conditions in Jerusalem are not good. Him going back could very easily have resulted in his own death or their death. Do you see? So, the disciples are fearful. These are extremely fearful circumstances. But what does the Lord Jesus Christ do? Let's look at his example. The Lord Jesus Christ obeys the Father. Obeys the Father. What do the disciples do? Ultimately, the disciples obey the Lord Jesus Christ. And they go back to Judea with him. So when whatever circumstances you find yourself, trust the Lord and obey. Don't compromise when the going gets tough. Obey the Lord. Deny yourself. Take up your cross daily and follow him. You're in a tough circumstance, adversity, calamity, whatever your circumstance, obey the Lord. Don't compromise, right? You maintain faithfulness to him. You pray and you worship and you plead with God for God to help you. You read the Bible. You study his word. You cry out to God to help you. You live for him. You attend the assembling of yourselves together. You put yourself around the brothers. You serve them and you love them and you keep crying out to God to help you in the trial. You keep doing that which God has ordained for your good as a means of grace to you, and you obey the Lord through the trial. What a lot of people do, a lot of times the, the reaction is to shut down, right? I'm in this terrible difficulty, and so I'm not going to go to church. We do the exact opposite of what we should do, 
right? We know that in times of need, we are desperate for him and that we should cling ever tighter to the cross. And yet somehow, even though we know that intellectually, when we face trials or difficulties, we abandon those things and we take our hands off, right? Take our eyes off the road, take our hands off the wheel. You wind up in a ditch when you do that. Trust him, obey him, cling to Christ when the going gets tough. Cling tighter. You deny yourself. You take up your cross daily and follow him. But Jesus now is determined to go up to Judea again. Disciples understandably fearful. And so Jesus responds to their fear with a metaphor in verse 9. In verse 9, Jesus answered to these fearful disciples, Are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. From this, I want to encourage you to trust and work. Trust and work. You're going to obey Christ, but you're not going to stop serving him either. You trust and labor, trust and serve, trust and work. This was a metaphor in verse 9 that they would have easily understood. Here it applies both to Jesus and to his disciples. We're going to see how the Lord responds, and we see how the disciples respond. Now, people of that time, they didn't have watches and alarm clocks and iPhones. And so they worked during daylight hours, and when daylight hours ended, work stopped. Right? They worked while it was day. When it got dark, you stopped working. Life, they understood, was also a portion to them as a day, so to speak. You lived during the day. That day symbolized the duration of your life that was allotted to you by God. We're all given a day. We're all given a day. That day has been allotted to us by God. We have 12 hours of light, so to speak, that you've been given. When you die, the daylight is over. You stumble into death. Your day is done. Your day is done. Each person has an apportioned amount of time that is determined and given them by God. God knows its length and God knows its brevity. No one can change it. That time is fixed by God. It has been given you by God. No one can lengthen it and no one can shorten it. You can't lengthen it or shorten it by caution or concern. You can't shorten it you can't lengthen it. That includes death threats being uttered by Jews. But that includes fears that you face in day-to-day -day life. God has fixed your appointed time, right? In that sense, our day, our lives, so to speak, have been ordained by God. What's the point of the Lord's metaphor here in verse 9? Use all 12 hours. Use up the whole thing. Right? Walk in him as long as you have daylight. Because it won't be long. That day is going to be over. As long as you are laboring for him, you won't stumble. As long as the Lord Jesus Christ is obeying the Father, seeking to please the Father, he's not going to stumble. He's got his day. His day has been apportioned by God. He is invincible until God is done. And he is going to use all 12 hours laboring for him. Work in the light. When it's over, your time is up. The workday ends. You stumble into death. For the disciples and for us, if you call yourself a Christian, you are walking in the brilliant revelation of he who is the light of the world. Walk and work while there is light and you won't stumble. We're not walking around in the dark. You walk around in the dark, you're going to stumble. We don't walk. We're people of God. We are Christians. We serve him. You walk in the light. Don't walk in the dark. You walk in the dark, you'll stumble. The way of the transgressor is hard and then you die. Don't retreat into a dark corner when you face difficulty like the heathen who do not know God. Don't live out your lives in isolation. There's no such thing as a Lone Ranger Christian. Get out there and labor while it is day. God is sovereign, and nothing will happen to you outside the ordained plan of God. You see? You're invincible until God is through with you. 
Don't squander your time. Redeem the time because the days are evil. You have 12 hours. Do you see? Labor. Use those 12. Don't squander it. Don't waste it. Before the light goes out for these disciples, they're going to face some tough, tough times. They're going to face tough circumstances. But with with so great a cloud of witnesses, right? They are faithful even to the end. Those tough circumstances will eventually take their lives. But you trust God. You believe in Christ. You trust him and you work. Deny yourself, take up your cross daily, and you follow him. Amen? just press upon you from the Lord's words in verse 9. Redeem your time. Redeem your time. Next, trust and believe. Trust and believe. In verse 11, these things he said, and after he said that to them, he let the truth of this metaphor that he had just given sink in for a moment. And then he said, our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. Sleep is often used as a metaphor for death in the Bible, especially of believers. In the Old Testament, they slept with their fathers. They slept with their fathers. They slept with their fathers, right? Waking him up obviously refers here to the Lord's intention to raise him from the dead. And I don't know if it's the disciples being a little fearful about what they were heading into or what the circumstances may have been, but they're a little confused by what he said. They're still a little shaky about their upcoming trip to the more. I mean... Not the morgue, but Judea. And so then the Lord has to explain in verse 12, his disciples said, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get well. We don't have to go. Listen, if he's sleeping, he'll get well. However, verse 13, Jesus spoke of his death. They thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. And Jesus said to them plainly, this is an example, a clear display of the Lord's omniscience. He says in verse 14, Lazarus is dead. He says in verse 15, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there. He's not rejoicing in the death of Lazarus. He's rejoicing with regard to the fruit that will be produced in the disciples. He says, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Count it joy, my brothers, when you fall into various trials. Be glad. Count it joy, my brothers, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Trust and believe. He had raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He had raised the widow of Nain's son. And now he was about to raise Lazarus. A little different here, right? Both Jairus' daughter and the widow of Nain's son raised almost immediately after they had died. Here, I think it's consequential that Martha mentions he's been in the tomb four days, partly because of that superstition. And again, the purpose of this miracle in raising, decomposing Lazarus from the dead is so that the glory of God would be revealed. He's about to raise Lazarus from the dead. But lastly, I want you to see, not just trust and obey, Not just trust and work, not just trust and believe, certainly all those things. But listen, trust all the way. Trust all the way. Verse 16, then Thomas, who is called Didymus, it means the twin. Thomas, who is called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. But Thomas gets the reputation from the end of John for being a doubter. He gets that from his conversation with the Lord at the end of the gospel. There are some who, in addition to painting Thomas as a doubter, also try to paint him here as nothing more than a complaining pessimist because of the statement that he makes here. But I want you to see the obvious truth of his statement in verse 16. This guy is no coward. Thomas is not a coward. Thomas is bold, and he is a courageous pessimist. (laughs) he is confidently pessimistic (laughs) he is bold he's no coward Thomas says I'm ready to trust and obey 
I'm going to use my 12 hours. And if my 12 hours ends in Judea, then let it end. I'll die with my Lord. Do you see? <laughs> I'm going to trust and work. I'm going to use my 12 hours. I'm ready to trust and believe. I'm going to trust Christ. I'll go with you, Lord, to Judea. And I'm ready to trust all the way to my death, Thomas says. I'm ready to deny myself, take up my cross right now, and follow him. It wasn't only Thomas that displayed that kind of courage. They all followed the Lord Jesus Christ to Judea, to Bethany. They all went with him. You know, it's interesting too, being that Bethany was so close to the city of Jerusalem, people knew Lazarus. People knew well Mary and Martha. They were very well known. And it was customary, and we'll find as we work through the text, many Jews, that word used again, and many of those who certainly were in opposition against Christ and others, came out of Jerusalem, just the quick two miles over to Bethany, Bethany, around the Mount of Olives, many came out. It was considered their duty, and they would have taken great honor in performing this duty of coming out and mourning with Mary and Martha the death of Lazarus. It was customary for them to do that. So many would have been there. The Lord, Thomas, and his disciples knew what they were headed into. And here, Thomas, let us go and we'll die with him. And all the disciples followed him to Bethany. Many will say, easy, right, to roll off the lips. I'll die for Christ, I'll die for Christ. And like Peter, they'll deny him in lesser things. The Lord is gracious. The Lord is merciful. The Lord is compassionate. He is slow to anger. He is of great kindness. He restores Peter. Listen, he'll restore you from your neglect this morning if you will repent and put your faith in him. As you have considered your circumstances, have you neglected being faithful to the Lord in them that God might be glorified? Listen, repent of that sin now. Turn from it. And with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, trust and obey. Trust and work. Trust and believe. And trust him all the way. Regardless of where those circumstances lead you, God is in sovereign control, working through your circumstances for both his glory and your good. Right? Right? You think to yourself, I want to live for Christ. I'm ready to die for him. Then don't deny him. Don't deny him in the work. Don't deny him in the means of grace. Don't deny him in obedience and in faithfulness and in fervency to him. Trust and work. Trust and obey. Trust and believe. Trust all the way. Take up your cross, right? Deny yourself. Follow him. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? There's some of you here this morning that don't know Christ. You've never turned from your sin. You've never put your faith in him. Maybe you have an understanding of God's sovereignty over these things. You have an understanding that both grace and faith and repentance are all gifts from God. And you think to yourself, I can't do anything unless God grants it to me. Listen, don't be fatalistic in your thinking. If you're here today and you don't know Christ, God calls out to you from his word. Turn from your sin and trust him. So God, I, 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 I want to repent. Grant me repentance. And God calls back to you. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I want to repent, God, but I can't repent unless you grant it to me. God says, repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, and trust me in your circumstances. You can't think. There's, there's absolutely no excuse to think fatalistically about these things. Turn from your sin. Stop being foolish. Stop putting yourself in the very circumstances that are oppressing you. Obey the Lord. Serve the Lord. Avail yourself of the means of grace Repent from your sin, trust Christ alone, and you'll be saved. God says he will save you. What does that look like? It looks like facing the circumstances of your life and choosing not to sin in them, but choosing to honor the Lord in them. 
choosing righteousness by faith in the Son of God who died and gave himself for you. Jesus Christ, I'm going to trust you that when I do righteousness in this circumstance, that you're there with me, that you'll be with me. You've promised to be with me to the end of the age, forever and ever, amen. I'm going to trust you, Christ, in my circumstances. I'm not going to sin. I'm going to trust you. All that sin is a bunch of waste. I mourn it. I hate it, God. I want you. I want salvation. I want forgiveness. I want Christ. And so when the difficulty comes, I trust you, Lord, and I obey. I trust and I serve. I trust and I live for you. I trust and I read your word to know you. I trust and I pray, crying out in dependence upon you. I trust you, Lord, and I turn from my sin, not in my own strength, but in the strength that you provide. I trust you, Lord. I depend upon you. Live that way. Stop being foolish. Turn from your sin. The way of the transgressor is hard. Lord Jesus Christ says that if you'll trust in him, turn from your sin, you can be saved. He'll wash you and cleanse you and forgive you. Stop living like a fool. If you're here today and you're a genuine brother, a genuine sister in Christ, then with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, seek to glorify God day by day minute by minute, circumstance by circumstance, when that difficulty faces you, God, I know that you have ordained this. How can I most honor you in the way that I respond, in the way that I act in these circumstances, in the way that I conduct myself? How can I glorify God? How can the glory of God be revealed in me when in his strength and in his power, in dependence upon him, the Son is glorified through me by the way that I respond in my circumstances? I want to live for you, God. I want to obey you in the trial. I want to labor for you. Or even more, I want to cling to the cross, Lord, in my trial that you might be glorified in it. We don't just glorify God with our lips when our hearts are far from him. No, we don't just simply glorify God by saying, I glorify you, Lord. It shows up in our words. It shows up in our works. It shows up in our worship. It shows up in our praise. It shows up in our proclamation of him shows up in the pattern of our lives trust and obey amen let's pray Father in heaven, how we thank you for this text. Thank you for the example of our Lord. What a glorious example. What kind instruction. Lord, you know all things. God, we are so short-sighted in our thinking. God, but you are infinitely wise and immeasurably gracious. And God, in your great omniscience, and with that great love with which you loved us, Lord, you ordain our circumstances for our good. Help us to see beyond the immediate difficulty and see the glory of God in our circumstances. Help us to live for you, Lord. God, forgive us for times where we have blamed you for the things that we've gone through or the difficulties that we face. God, please forgive us for that travesty. God, we acknowledge your goodness and your kindness and your compassion. And Lord, we desire from the heart to live for you and to honor you and to see you exalted. You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory and power. So help us, Lord. We we often fail miserably. But Lord, we, we see how gracious you are that even in our failings, you lovingly chasten us as a heavenly father and you strengthen us by your spirit and you inform us through your word. You're so good to us, God. Just, we want to respond to that goodness and that compassion and that kindness and that sanctification, Lord, with praise and 
worship and obedience and service and love and evangelism and Lord, all those things that we need to be spending our day doing. Help us, God. We need you. We need your word. God, we need your spirit to empower us, to enable us. Help us to use the 12 hours you've given us to max it out for you, Lord, to serve you faithfully and fervently. Lord, it, it, we know how prone to wander we are, Lord. I know, Lord, that when we say amen to this prayer and we get up to leave this room, there will be many that will leave to go back to their lives unchanged. God, I pray that it wouldn't be. Please forgive us. God, please grant repentance. When the alarm goes off on tomorrow morning, God, please let us hit the ground running for you, believing in you, trusting in you, worshiping you, praising you, serving you, living for you fervently. God, we are your people called by your name and for your great name's sake. Hallow yourself in our eyes. Grant us repentance and faith, Lord. Strengthen us to live for your glory. We love you, Lord. It's for Christ and because of Christ that we pray all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.